Welcome to the She Will Shine podcast, where we bring you the real stories of female business owners. My name is Danielle Price and I'm the founder of She Will Shine, a supportive business network for women. It's time to give a voice to women in business and discover their journey. Welcome to the She Will Shine podcast. Today we're joined by the lovely Amanda Freeman. How are you, Amanda? I'm very well, thank you. Lovely to be here. Oh, lovely to have you. So for those who may not know Amanda, Amanda Freeman helps purpose-driven entrepreneurs and space holders reclaim themselves from old stories, beliefs, and social expectations. In safe, sacred space, they conquer fears, clear energy blocks, and develop sky-high confidence in order to make powerful, intuitive life and business decisions. When she's not holding space for her clients, you'll find her at home with her family among the trees in Melbourne, usually walking in the forest, snuggling her pup, swimming, drinking herbal tea with chocolate, of course, of course, Amanda, (laughs) or learning all things healing, spirituality, conscious business and personal growth. So welcome to our podcast, Amanda. As I said before, it's great to have you here. I guess your business is not one that's traditional, I would say. Um, Is this something that you've always been interested in? Um, Great question. I think for me, um, my business is really taken its time to land where I really feel like it's finally all me. Um, It's that real blend of the energy and the practical. I think over the years, I've sort of swayed between one dynamic and the other. So my journey originally started as a healing practitioner. um, And it was very much about the energy work and Um, that aspect of it and then over the years particularly more and more working with women in business um, I really tapped into my love of the practical as well I'm very much a type a personality I was you know loved learning at school very driven and very focused and you know you kind of think of energy work or you think of energy practitioners and you know the um what would you say the stereotype is you know airy fairy and off with the clouds and things like that and I've never really been that I've always been very firmly grounded whilst also honoring the energy so for me yeah like well 12 years into my business this year the last couple of years I've really felt grateful to sort of um almost like I don't know I think it's when I hit 40 like I turned 40 and I'm like right enough of this trying to you know be what everyone wants and do the business that you know the business mentors or the coaches are telling me to do like this is me this is like 50 50 I love energy work but we also need to get shit done like there's that's just the way it is and so yeah I think for me my like someone said to me the other day you know how do you describe yourself and I've got on my like Instagram for for example at the moment says energy coach Um, and that's the closest I can come to combining both so I do coaching but also do energy work work. (laughs) there you go put the two words together put the two words together that's what I do but people are like what even is that so I think yeah it's been an interesting personal journey really stepping into my strengths as a um, as a mentor and coach and, and practitioner and it's, it's funny, so many of the women that I speak to who are similarly in business seem to have this same sort of experience when they hit like either their 40s or their 50s where they just go, you know what, this is just how I, what I do and how yep. I do it. And It's like can, an, finally like an acceptance lump of who we are. It's like yeah. just an acceptance. This is who I am. This is what I want. If you're going to support me, great, have you on board. If you're not, see you later. Like it's yeah. just a real choice to kind of move in the direction of your choosing. Yeah, and I think for me, the hardest thing in in landing where I am now is that, you know, prior to doing um, predominantly healing and coaching with women in business, I did um, a lot of Reiki training. So I would hold Reiki circles at my um, studio. I would teach, I taught all levels of Reiki all the way up to mastery. And, you know, that may be something I do again um, when I don't have limited time. Obviously with my kids, I really had to, choose I've got a um, 15 year old and a 17 year old I really had to choose where can I where's the one area that I'm choosing to focus Um, and the hardest thing was that I love teaching Reiki like I love the uh ahas I love people walking away with this self-healing tool I love bringing people together for healing and connection like 
the hardest thing is when you love something, still choosing to go in another direction. Um, yeah. And I think that's probably not talked about enough. Like people think, oh, you stop doing something in your business because you hate it or it's the worst thing in the world. That's never been my experience. Um, I worked uh, in pharmacy before. I think we've spoken about this before. And I didn't start my own business because I hated working in pharmacy. I quite like that industry as well. I love that I get to help people um, in that area. I love using all aspects of my personality, but I loved this more. So yeah. that takes up more of my time. And I think it's, yeah, that and or narrative that we're so ingrained into us, into our society, you either like something or you don't, is really doing a disservice to women because particularly women in business, when we are running our businesses, we are bringing all aspects of ourselves to the table and it's not and or it's yep. our skills as you know mothers if we have children our skills as um you know smart business women it's our, our patience it's our tenacity like yeah I think it's so important that these aspects are really honored and acknowledged and we can say you know I'm going to evolve what I'm doing now or what I'm doing, not because I hated what I was doing before, but because I'm pulling the threads of that, that are most um, lighting me up and yep. I'm going to take them with that me. That are filling my cup week. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that, like you said, it evolves over time because the skills that I had 20 years ago are different to the skills I have now. Mm. And they're and not your just... interest as well. Yeah, that that's right. And it's it's not just but business things, it's personal things. Like, you know, mm. I've had my kids in the last 20 years and that's changed me as a person. Yeah. And I guess we've had lots of these discussions where people, I know myself included, you don't realise the amount of personal development you go through when mm. you start a business and when as your business evolves. It's like a, a never-ending cycle that, you know, you're um, evolving and you're learning and you're, you know, using different skills at different times and, it doesn't it doesn't end it just no. keeps on going and yet there is that narrative out there that you will reach a certain point of success in your business journey and so I think we have to be really careful not to be like oh I'm going to this end result and when I get there I am successful because that point is always moving like yeah. you know there's always something in our world you know hello coronavirus um that's changed you know that that causes us to pivot and change or a new season you know for those of us with kids a new season of our children's experience will again change our capacity I know I've really noticed that this year with my daughter doing year 12 um just the the needs of her and my capacity I've had to juggle things around in my business to make sure she's feeling supported in this final year of school and you know I couldn't have anticipated that last year she she actually got through quite well um, in year 11 so I think you know the more we can lean into this idea of we're always evolving yeah. and it's okay to evolve and it's okay to let things go that are no longer serving us um, yeah and I can't remember what I what podcast it was but someone was talking about you know the science of quitting we, we have this, this fear of saying, I'm going to let that go. You know, because if I let that go, does that mean I'm a failure? That's what's associated with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've failed. I've, I've, you know, not done what that big, you know, if you've had your five-year goal and you get to year four and you let that go because something else has, you know, caught your eye or circumstances change, it's really easy to lean into that and go, oh my gosh, I failed. I didn't get my five-year goal. Whereas really what's probably happened is you've evolved and you've yeah. grown and that's amazing. And your definition of success has actually changed. Yes. Along that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because I found within our community, Amanda, you're one of our Shield Shy members, mm -hmm. the, um, the discussion that goes around what we see as success Mm. And what is portrayed, I guess, on socials, in the media as success is very different to what we feel as women in business mm. is successful to us. Um, and I really love the way the businesses that are within our community, yours included, you've created your own definition of success. Yeah. And you've said, like you said, you know, I've turned 40, this is what I want, this is how I'm doing it. And I've finally accepted it. But for a long time, people, you know, 
oh, I should be doing this. Like the word should is like top of their kind of vocabulary. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. That's what's going to lead me to that six-figure business at the end of the day that everybody else tells me I should be having. Mm. Have you found that, I guess, in your work as well, um, but also in your own life, that earlier on that's been sort of something that's in the back of your mind or not really? Oh, definitely. I think um, I joined an online community in 2015 and, you know, prior to then my business had been very local. Um, I'd built my practice to be fully booked the three days that I worked all through word of mouth over, you know, four years. And that was a really slow, steady, organic process. And that worked beautifully for me because my kids at the time were like three and five. Um, my young, my eldest had just started school, my youngest kinder. And time-wise, it was just so great. Like I was slowly getting more clients and now settling into their, you know, and it was just beautiful. And then I was transported into this whole new world. It was an online um, incubator group with women literally all over the world. And I was like, what? is this like I don't even understand half the things you're saying and like what six figure months six figure years like I that had never all all I knew was that I'd reached capacity in my one-to-one practice like I didn't want to be doing more than three days and I needed my business I needed to know some more business skills of what was possible for me to you know perhaps scale or how can I use some of my offerings in different ways and you know my mind was just like completely blown so I think the first year of that it was a lot of should I really I mean I I met some incredible people much like you know the she will shine group um, who I'm still besties with today all over the world I actually was literally just on a call with one of them from New Zealand like before we recorded this so we've known each other for like seven years through being in this group which is incredible but yeah that first year I was really overwhelmed I think I doubted myself in terms of um oh gosh, do I even know what I'm doing as a woman in business? Even though I built my, you know, practice organically over four years without marketing, you know, on the internet. I wasn't even on Facebook at that point. Like, you know. Oh, what a good life you led. (laughs) Oh, I know. What a a peaceful mental life I led at the time. Um, So, yeah. So I think I definitely fell into the shoulds. I think I lost my confidence there. I joined for more confidence and clarity. I think that first year was really like, oh crap, have I done it all wrong? And I don't know how to do things online and my website is really bad and I'm not sure like there was so many questions um but I think after that first year I really I mean I've got a very strong sense of self I've always been very clear on my values I've always been very clear on my purpose which is to be of service and to really help others like that's why I how I ended up in my business and how it got to where it it did Um, so yeah, I think over the years, I've definitely been better at letting go of those shoulds. But I think when we're constantly bombarded with other people's stories um, and just the surface levels of the stories, like, you know, when you see someone's six-figure business, you don't hear about the, you know, the three team members that they had or the $10,000 of Facebook ads they spent or, you know, like I really love following entrepreneurs that say, yes, I made my six figures, but this much then went to cost. Like I had a, a beautiful email from someone whose membership I'm in and she did a launch breakdown and she's like, this was my costing, this was my profit. And it was like, it was so refreshing to be like, oh, and she's like, this is what I didn't do. Well, this is what I would do differently next time. It's like, those are the conversations that inspire me because I think that's where we really, we really learn um, what it takes uh, to, to get those kind of numbers and also what the reality is like yeah. you know this is what I was about to say yeah yeah that she had a wedding so she didn't email as much and she forgot to send out a link and you know like there is no perfect there is no perfect business moments we're always going to be learning and growing no matter what we're doing um and I even found that last year I, the last couple of years I've run an online mastermind and the first time I ran it, I was like, oh, that was really great, but needs a bit tweaking. Second time I ran it, I'm like, okay, this is what's missing. Third time I ran it, I'm like, yeah. great. Now we're finally hitting our strides of this is what people really need and this is the most supportive container. Fourth time I ran it, there was very little I had to change. But imagine if I had have just run it that one time and gone, oh, that was good, but I only had like four people and, you know, I didn't get many people sign up. And imagine if I had have stopped there because it wasn't like the perfect 
thing. You know, it was only by doing it over two years again and again and again and really listening to what my um, clients were telling me about what was working and what wasn't that I was able to, you know, create the experience that I did in the end. So I think now I'm very much open to trial and error. Like there's all we can do is follow that those universal breadcrumbs, I call them, where we get that think thing of, oh, I think I'm going to try this or, you know, listening to our people. Um, and that's, that's what it's all about. And that's more powerful than any shoulds. The shoulds are really um, a sign that we're not listening to our intuition. We're disconnected yeah. from our purpose or our own inner strength and grounding. Um, so I always say to people, you know, if you, if you're shooting, then come, come back to center, come, you know, go and do whatever grounds you, whether that's movement or meditation or journaling, get back to what is your purpose what are you, you know, what do you, what's your dream for your business? Who are you serving? And then think about what you have to do because the shoulds tend to evaporate when we're, we're grounded in that purpose. Yeah, you know? that's yeah. Right. exactly right. The word should, I think, should just be eliminated from the hmm. dictionary. They're adding all these new words. They should get rid of a couple. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, again, as women, we, we, we wear so many hats and we're so hard on ourselves. I think our generation has more access to technology and more access to support in many ways, but there's also more expectation to do so many things simultaneously. Um, you know, like when I think back to my grandmother, she had seven kids and she didn't have, you know, probably at one point, probably, I don't know, she had a washing machine that whole time, you know, she didn't drive. So her ability to get out and about and her ability for self-development was restricted but her role was raise her children and yeah. she had one focus and one focus only so you know while I feel sad that she had no scope for that personal whatever lit her up that maybe she had to put aside for that role that she she you know stepped into um, and what was culturally expected of her um, you know, we're still expected to do that. We're still expected right. to mother at that as if we had no other. Yeah, that's right. Mother jobs. as if you've got no children and work as if you've got, uh, mother as if you've got no job yeah. and work as work if you've got, like no you've got no children. Yeah, that's And right. I feel that so deeply, that pressure. And I think it is like intergenerational. Um, my mum didn't work until I think my, my young brother was at high school. So she kind of stepped into that paradigm her mom had so it's it's kind of been interesting to watch it through the generations um sort of shift and and it was always very confronting for her that I was working um and I remember at one point because my kids are two years apart I was like I need to put these kids in childcare, and I think I took them to occasional care for like three hours or something and my mom was horrified like why don't you call me I'll come and look after them guess what my mom does now what She's a childcare worker. She's a childcare educator. She's like, well, if I had have known they had to do all this training and how much they love the kids, I wouldn't have had a problem with it. <laughs> I had this worse guilt for dropping my kid, kids off for three hours. With like, strangers who don't care for I know, children. <laughs> I would sneak off to occasion. What did you do today? Nothing. Like I dropped them at occasional care for three hours and then like spend the like an hour bawling in my car because I'd failed as a mother because I needed a break. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I tease her about that quite often. I'm like, yeah, and now what do you do? Look after other people's kids. And she loves it. Like she's, uh, she always um, had a dream to be either a teacher or a kindergarten teacher. So to see her sort of doing that now is, is lovely. Although I actually think her real, real dream was um, to be in like design or architecture. So, again, like we are so lucky. Like I've chosen my path fully and completely. Like I've followed my inner nudges. I followed what lights me up. I've had a very supportive husband who has like cheered me on every step of the way. And, you know, earlier generations didn't have that. My mom has ended up doing something that she enjoys, but she's in her sixties now. Like she had so many years where yeah. she was wrestling with that narrative of I want to be a good mum and that means staying at home and I have to wait until all of my kids are all grown so I can look for me so I think it's such a mixed blessing isn't it yeah. that where we find yeah. ourselves you know and the expectations that we well that's hold it, ourselves the to. expectations then because then we then compare ourselves to how our parents or how our mothers mothered us yeah and we're like hang on 
am I there enough for my kids? Yeah. You know, we're trying to work, we're trying to take the kids to all the activities and do whatever and kind of have, have some time in there for ourselves and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, oh, hang on, do the kids need me? Am I there? Mm. And it's just that expectation of, hang on a minute, I'm not doing this the same as my mum. Yeah. I'm not doing good enough. Yeah. It's really full on. And I hear that a lot in the women that I work with. It's that constant, again, recentering of, you know, we can only do our best. And I think for me, that's very always been very much a big measure of what success is for me. It's not really been about the numbers. I mean, obviously we're in business. We want to be making a profit. Um, but my husband and I spoke very early on about the fact that for me, being a present mother was going to be most important, especially um, one of my daughters has needed sort of, you know, extra care and extra resources and things like that. So that's meant I've, one of us has had to be flexible for appointments and things like that. And, you know, I said from the start, I'm happy to, for that to be my role and my business will mold around the needs of our children. And so the fact that I've been able to get them to high school and, and have that and still feel really fulfilled. Like I, was speaking to um, one of my students, one of my very first clients, very first students that journeyed with me for like many, many, many years. Well, I messaged her the other day because I bumped into her sister and um, she's like, oh, I think of you often, like, gosh, so many good times. And I'm like, oh, my my 30s was when I really first stepped into my, my personal passion and purpose and really gave myself permission to start teaching Reiki and start my own business. And, you know, like so many amazing things that I created whilst raising my children and I feel very grateful like if if I dropped off the earth tomorrow I'd be like I I've been very lucky I'm very grateful I've I've achieved what I wanted to make a difference in people's lives raise happy children you know have a husband that I love like that's it for me um yep. and then I feel like I'm probably moving into the season now where revenue is going to kind of take front of stage because my kids you know my daughter will be 18 this year um they're not needing us as much and I'm kind of easing myself into I can really focus on my business will be able to look very different yeah um and that's going to be yourself that permission that yes okay now I can I can focus a bit more on the business yeah and I know a lot of you know a lot of women do when their kids are young and and do it in a different way and um I think we have to respect that we each yeah we each do it in our own way there's no right or wrong I know women who've worked full-time since their babies were three months old and and that's what they have needed to do for their happiness and their vision of success so you know I'm by no means saying my way is is the the right way but I'm really grateful that together um you know in in partnership with my my husband we were able to go what does what's our vision for family happiness and success and this is what it it was for us and yeah super I feel very lucky that I've I don't know just been able to do what I love and yeah. raise my kids like, not lucky Amanda you've created lucky. that though like we, yeah I think we use the term lucky so loosely yeah yeah but it has very, been very intentional like you say very intentional and not always perfect like you know, there have been times where I, you know, as the the person who does all the organising and all the running around and I've been like, oh, you have no idea the emotional labour and time and energy. And, you know, on my husband, on the other hand, is like, oh, being the, the main breadwinner is really stressful. Like we all have our cross yes. to bear in we these have choices. Our yes. <laughs> you know? um, and sometimes we vocalise these gripes, Amanda. <laughs> correct, correct. But um. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to be moving into, and I said to my daughters, like, just give me a few years before you go, like, getting hitched and having grandbabies because I just, you know, I, I need some time to really just do my do my thing with a little bit of freedom. Right. So I'm going to take you back to you at your kid's age. So when you were 16 or 18, did you have any, like, were you into kind of, you know, the energy space and healing because it would have been a very different landscape then than what it is mm. now. Yeah. Um, but like, what were your kind of passions then? I was always either going to be, um, like we used to play schools when we were kids. I'd line up all my cousins and I'd be the teacher and I'd give them worksheets. I'd use my dad's fax machine to copy worksheets that I would Love create. It. 
So yeah. I always loved, um, yeah, playing teacher. I always was always um, rounding them up to do plays. I was very much into performing arts. So we had, mum and dad had a um, video camera and school holidays would be me pulling out the dress up box, rounding up my cousins, writing a script, filming them, directing them um, in these plays and whatnot. So I was very bossy, um, loved organizing. No, you're, you're a very good leader. <laughs> I was very good. I was practicing my leadership skills from a That's very right, early yeah. age. <laughs> um, loved performing arts, um, was very heavily into drama from uh, year 10, uh, 11, 12. Uh, oh, probably even earlier, really, I started drama classes when I was 12. And that was my direction was to be um, an actor. So I um, actually auditioned for the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts for NIDA up in Sydney, um, got pretty close to getting into NIDA one year and then realised that because of my back injury, that was going to be a problem because there's so much physical movement classes and things like that. And I kind of talked myself out of that and was like, oh, I'll never be accepted because of my disability. Whereas probably now looking back, I, if I had have been able to verbalise, hey, I've got a a back injury that happened when I was 11 and I have ongoing issues. What are the, what are the compensations that are made for people who aren't able-bodied to join this program? But back then I didn't know about things like ableism or, um, you know, a fair access and, and all the sort of things that are more widely understood now. So I kind of talked myself out of that. I was very depressed and I was, I had no idea what I was going to do because that was, you know, that was my dream from a very, I used to watch the Oscars and I used to visualise myself being on stage, getting the Oscar and like, it was a dream. Oh, wow. It was a big yeah. hardcore dream. So um, yeah, I think my dreams were kind of dashed through that experience of realising my body probably wouldn't handle what was needed. Um, and I think the third, third year of trying out for NIDA and getting down to the last 30 and then not getting but getting through, I was like, kind of threw my toys out of the cot. Um, and then just went to part-time work um, in pharmacy and I did tr try uni. I started a psychology degree, ended up transferring over to education and just, I burnt out. Like I was burnt out from, yeah, yeah year 12 everything. and everything, I think. Yeah. And probably also that was part of my sort of healing journey. I'd had had an accident when I was 11 was left with chronic pain and again didn't really have the language to express what I was feeling I just kept trying to fit in and pretend I was kind of like everyone else because to look at me yeah. you wouldn't know that I've got you know that injury so I think for me the healing component came in when someone said to me oh have you ever tried Reiki and I'm like no I haven't tried Reiki I might as well give it a go like you know and this, um, this lady was just so amazing. She really um, helped me connect back into my personal power. And she's like, why don't you come and join this class and you can learn how to do this for yourself. And then just over the next, when did I do? So I did my Reiki level one in 2000. Um, and then over the next five years, it was really about healing myself. It was about, you know, understanding my pain verbalizing the experience of like nine years of being a kid with chronic pain and not having the language around that understanding that I could still be a whole being and and reach my dreams and goals with this um, physical condition so I met my husband we had our first daughter and then in 2005 I did the next level of Reiki training so I think over that it was such a deep personal journey in that five yeah. years um, and it was another five years before I opened my business. So really that time from 2000, uh, the year 2000 to year 2010 was probably just all about finding me um, and finding my skill and recognising that through my journey of depression, through my journey of chronic pain, I had something to offer in terms of helping people manage, you know, really challenging times within themselves. And I think that's when that uh, facilitator, teacher um, side of my personality and purpose really came firing back. And I was like, okay, well, all my years of performing arts has really helped me with confidence in speaking, confidence in facilitating. Um, so, you know, everything just kind of started to come together and I'm like, okay, this yeah. is what I'm meant to be doing. This feels right. This feels right. And so once I started, um, yeah, working as a healing practitioner, of course, my clients were like, how can I learn how to do this? So then I'm like, 
okay, better go get my master teacher training so I can yeah. teach it. Because I was fine, I was literally Googling people to send my clients to to teach them how to do Reiki. And I was like, just, you know, do the next level. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I did. Um, and then from there, the next level of that was that my practitioner students were like, how do I run a business? <laughs> And I'm like, okay, so it's not inherent because for me, it felt very second nature. Like I just, um, I just started. And if I was lacking in a skill, I would look up the council website and see what their economic development, um, you know, what $30 workshop they had on marketing. And I'd attend that. And then, so I was very self, very driven to just learning on the go, but I recognized through teaching others that that wasn't something inherent in anyone, in everyone. And so I started to create resources on how to run a business. And then I moved into working, you know, that was kind of about the same time that I joined that online group. And I really recognized that working with women in business was the next step. Like this is, I wanted to see women succeed and maybe not take, because it really did take me, well, I did my practitioner level training, for example, in 2005, it took me five years to have the confidence to open my own business. So I really wanted to shorten that time frame and say, okay, these are the things that are going to come up. This is how you're going to sabotage. This is the confidence you need to have in yourself. These are the practical steps you need to take. And I was, I really felt like I was shortening that, that journey for people, which was super exciting because we need to be out there yeah. quickly. Like we need more women out in business. We need more women showing up and having that confidence to say, I can do this. Um, to believe they're qualified enough and not have to wait ridiculous <laughs> lengths of well, time. That's the thing as well, because like for us, I know my journey, it sounds very similar to yours, in that it's over the years, I can't even know how to word this rightly, but it's over, it's through our experience, which has mm. taken us X amount of time, mm. that we've um, learnt the skills and learnt mm. what we needed you know what I mean like you go through the experience go oh well that's what I needed then yeah and then you go through that experience and that's what I needed then but it's only going through the experience that you learn those things you can't predict no what someone else needs it's like you have to be walking in their shoes yeah maybe one step or two steps ahead of them to know what what um what barriers are going to come up what challenges are going to come up what support they're going to need and at what time And you can't obviously, you know, you can't shorten someone's journey completely because they're going to have their own journey of their own, you know, like you said, their own things that you can't foresee. But I think, you know, having someone a few steps ahead and not ahead in terms of hierarchical, but in terms of the experience can really just shorten that time that you might spend being stuck or overwhelmed or not knowing the next step. Um, and I love that, you know, I always think of that image, that gif or whatever of one woman going up the ladder and she's holding her hand down, yeah. you know, and, and that's kind of how I see the journey. I mean, there's been so many women who have supported me up each next level. You know, I've sort of followed them and then I've had, had my hand down saying, come on, your turn sort of thing. And, and that's, you know, that's how it's always been, like women Such supporting women, isn't yeah, it? Right. Like. That's, that's what, what it's, it's about. What's the saying before? No, when you get to where you're going, turn around, um, and help the person behind you because they were you. I think that's a that. saying or something similar to that. Yeah, I love that. And one of my favorite authors um, is uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book Women Who Run with Walls. Oh no! But Basically, it it's incredible. She's a psychotherapist, but she's also a storyteller, and so she's weaved together these incredible stories of folklore stories through the lens of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. I think psychotherapist is the right term. Um, and one of her stories, you know, talks about women coming together and this this fact that women have always come together in circle. And when one woman falls falls aside, exhausted and depleted she doesn't need to worry because another woman will step up and take her place. And then when she's restored, she will come and take the place of another woman who needs to rest. So that, that story is just one of my favorites, because I think sometimes we think no matter what we have to push and push and put our needs aside and hustle and go, even when we've got nothing left and we forget that there's always someone around us that if we simply just say, I need some help, we'll step forward. And, you know, we need to rest. We don't rest enough in our culture right now. We just don't. If I've been in isolation for, you know, six days now with my daughter having COVID and 
you know, I just, every time this has happened, whether it's been lockdown or now, you know, so being in ISO, I notice how much running around we do on a daily basis and just how exhausting it is and how much we, we don't really build in that rest because we have to do this and then we have to do that and then we have to do that. And I think, yeah, that's something that I'm always saying to my clients and I've really enjoyed just witnessing now how much, how the difference in how we can feel if we have this rest and it shouldn't yeah. take a pandemic and the requirements that we have to make for us to have long periods of rest. rest. Like it, it shouldn't, it yeah. shouldn't be taking up. It's interesting because I kind of think that, um, you know, we, I wouldn't say we learned from our parents' mistakes, but we've learned from our parents' experiences mm. and now our kids will learn from our experiences. So it'll be really interesting to see your, both your daughters, 16 and 18. Is that right? 16 and 18? Yeah, 15, yeah. almost 16, almost 18. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, they'll say 16 and 18. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how they, you know, how they go about finding themselves and um, what the difference is. Where will it be easier for them than mm. what we had it? But also where will the challenges be that may be different to our challenges? Yeah, honestly, it is, is going to be so interesting. I mean, for both of my kids, I've really worked very hard on giving them language to speak to where they don't fit into the boxes that maybe society likes to put young girls in. So um, I've been super proud watching them really advocate for their needs in different areas. Um, I won't go into specifics just because it's not my stories to tell, but um, you know, that's been really great because I didn't have that experience. Like my mum didn't have the language to talk about, you know, um, how to speak up for myself. So for, for me, that's been something really important for my children, even things like um, when my daughter started, you know, year 10 and she didn't understand something. Okay, send an email to your teacher. Say, I don't understand that. Or she's, um, my eldest has celiac disease. So from very early on when we're at a restaurant, I have celiac disease. Is it safe for me to eat here? Like things that most people go, oh, a 10-year-old, you know, why, why aren't you asking those questions? Because she's going to be a celiac for the rest of her life. She needs to feel confident right now asking those right. questions. So I, I feel that that experience will be different where I had no language to say what was going on in my body or how I was feeling or, or anything like that. And I resulted in burnout and depression when I was like 19. Um, I feel like they might not have to go down that road, but then I haven't had the experience of severe isolation and disconnection and uncertainty that they've had as, as far as COVID has gone. So it's anyone's guess how that's going to impact them. And I don't know that we have been able to understand that experience to give them the tools to navigate it as, you know, with as much ease as possible because we don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be really, really interesting to see what they turn around and go, you know, these were the gaps in my upbringing and this is what I learned. I mean, I feel, I hope that my kids have watched me work. Like, as I said, my, my youngest was in kinder and my eldest was in uh, prep when I started my business. So they've seen what it's like for someone to follow their dreams. And that's something I'm most proud of because right from the get-go, I've been, yep, I'm working today. And this is my, they know not to come out when I'm, you know, out in the studio on a call, when I used to do run classes, they loved nothing more than coming and help setting up. They'd often leave a little note on the whiteboard. Love it. Um, you know, I really love that they've had that experience of seeing their mum, you know, follow her passion. So I hope there's enough really positive experiences in there that they'll walk away feeling like they can kind of do whatever they want in the world. Um, yep. But time will tell they're their time own humans so that's right our while we can you know and even it's really interesting my husband and I often say this my two kids are so different from each other and sometimes I'm like like we raise them the same they've been in the same household like we've taught them the same values we've had the same conversations and yet they're like chalk and cheese so it's going to be really interesting to see what each of their narratives are of our, <laughs> their upbringing you know so yeah interesting Really interesting. Looking back, Amanda, over say the last twenty odd years, would you have done anything differently, or do you think like this this was the right 
path for you or it maybe took you a little bit longer than you would have thought? Um, look, I am not. Any of the dreams I had when I was or goals when I look back at career day in year 10 or whatever, I'm not doing any of those things, but I am doing all of the elements that drew me to the things that I wrote down. So I'm facilitating and teaching and I'm being of service and I'm helping people, um, I'm teaching people. So I don't think I'd do anything differently. I think my journey has been literally just follow the breadcrumbs and it's, you know, I love where I am now. I, I think probably the, when I hit 30, I really felt like I was living a life that I was meant to. Um, so yeah, I don't think I would do anything differently. I, I always wanted to have kids young. I mean, didn't expect to have my kids straight away as quickly as we did. Um, like people said, oh, it could take you a couple of years to get pregnant. And I was pregnant like two weeks after my wedding. Um, so that was a bit unexpected. So I probably often say to my husband, like it would have been great for us to have a little bit more time together before having children and and all the the fullness that that brings but then I wouldn't change that either because I love the stage I'm at with my life and where my kids are so no I I think I'm I think I'm where I'm meant to be and I think the journey has been what it's meant to be I, I don't think I would change anything because then I wouldn't be here and I really like here so yeah. <laughs> perfectly answered Amanda just beautiful I think that's I think that's yeah giving yourself that permission as well too kind of think back and go well actually mm. you know because often we're so busy trying to look forward and you know at the challenges that are coming and the mm. next steps we've got to take that we don't actually look back and go wow look how far I've come mm. yeah and look I think when I think of 19 year old me who was super depressed and just no clue that anything good in my life was coming like really dark days I think when I look back to her and you know sometimes I'll actually imagine sending her you know what what my life is now and and I kind of wonder whether some of that energy reached her and gave her the strength to go on you know um I would be wrapped you know if I could have got a peek and be like ah oh, everything's going to be okay you know despite you know there's been some tough years don't get me wrong my gosh on so many levels for, through my business through my health through having kids there have been some really challenging times in my marriage, like all the things. But yeah, I'm. I feel like I'm where I'm meant to be. So I, I don't think I would change any of it, except for maybe you know the painful, the most painful bits we'd like to not have to yeah. have. But then that's kind of sometimes where the biggest growth comes, isn't it? That's, right, that's where the learnings are. That's where the biggest learnings are. Yeah. And you can't have, you know, you can't have the rainbow without the rain, the rain. can you? So recognizing that we're just going to continue to have these forever cycles and I think um, another book that I really loved was um, Buddhism for Mothers um, and there was one part in there where she says you know once you recognize that you know life is suffering and we're going to have these continual challenges it's almost like you can exhale because you've got through the last one so you're going to get through the next one so really just cherishing these moments of our life where we have the sun and we have the, the good seasons and knowing that when the not so good seasons come we'll have that tenacity and we'll have that courage to to navigate that and get to the other side of that too you know yeah 100 percent. Hmm. thank you so much for your time today amanda it is an absolute pleasure oh thanks <laughs> i love i love talking about this sort of stuff i love i love talking to other women about our passion and our purpose and what's possible and yeah redefining just redefining our own version of success all of these things are, are so important um to me and to my heart so yeah it's been lovely to just just to, to talk about them and and share about them with you so thank you for for inviting me oh you're very welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us as well i hope you've enjoyed amanda's story as much as i have and we'll see you next time on the she will shine podcast Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode of the She Will Shine podcast, we invite you to check out shewillshine.com.au. She Will Shine is the essential support network you need to grow a thriving, meaningful business. We can help you grow your network, connect and develop genuine relationships, be supported and support others in building and growing a successful business on your terms. 
Say goodbye to working alone and become a member at shewillshine.com.au.